Hey guys, this is Gov- Eric Vento with Government to Private. Um, this the purpose of this podcast is to show a wide variety of journeys and stories of people who are transitioning out of the government to the private sector, and really show you that there's so many different ways to go from point A to point B. And hopefully this this serves as an encouragement for you if you're currently in the transition process or you're currently considering the transition. So with us today is Jim Savage. Jim and I have known each other for several years now, and he's always been a good friend and a mentor, but I'm going to let him introduce himself shortly. He brings with him a really, really fantastic career in federal law enforcement, as well as in the C-suite of the executive corporate security sector. So Jim, thanks so much for being with us today. Hey, my pleasure, Eric. Um, You know, I've enjoyed the relationship with you um, and really, you know, we've talked so much about this topic um, and I'm thrilled that you're now specializing in it, been able to help so many different people. And, and to your point, um, I'm sure my experiences that I'm going to relate are going to be different than others, but that's part of the point um, is that you can have different avenues, different ways to kind of get to where you're going. Absolutely, brother. I can't wait to explore some of that with you. So let's go ahead and jump in. Can you provide an overview of your uh, your career? So it's it's almost painful to do um, <laughs> in, 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 the, in the sense there's it, it really I know it's an overused term these days, but it really has been a journey. Um, you know, I started my law enforcement career way back in the early 80s with Texas DPS law enforcement as a trooper. You know, four years there, um, had a great time, and and I'm always quick to give credit to that organization, Texas DPS, for providing amazing uh, and really respected leadership, discipline, and values. I, I was young and immature, and I matured quite a bit um, in my my four years with with DPS, and that translated well into my uh, my second. Um, role, if you will, uh, where I came on board with the Secret Service as a special agent, did a little over 20 years with them. And, you know, I'm one of these people that has never been great um, at any one thing, but I've been pretty good at a lot of things. And and so that's those attributes, if you will, serve me well later down the road. Um. And, you know, after my my 20 years with the Secret Service, you know, I was one of these people that had a a, a very, um, very good career. I was in upper management. I was in SES with with Secret Service. And my, my trajectory was was nothing but up. I was there in Washington, D.C. But, you know, Eric, I got to the point and maybe maybe some of your viewers, listeners have gotten this point where the further I went up that ladder in the organization, the the less I enjoyed it and the less like it was the actual role why I joined the organization. So um, I got some really good advice from a Secret Service um, alumnus who had retired and moved on. And we went to lunch one day and I said, John, I said, I, I'm kind of thinking about it may be time for, for me to retire and, and maybe look at at something else and you know i was in my late 40s and i and and so my good friend said jim he goes he goes all i can tell you goes i can't tell you when it's going to be time i cannot tell you that but he goes when it's time you will know it he goes (laughs) you'll know and and so um as vague as that guidance was he was he was spot on so i i knew i was at that point where i wanted the next challenge. I, I wanted to basically for, for using a business term, if you will, I wanted to monetize that experience um, in the private sector. You know, I was still, I still felt like I had an awful lot to to offer to a private sector organization. And, and frankly, you know, um, hopefully um, command a, a very respectable salary for that while I still had had time to do it. Um, and, you know, but my, my greatest concern was, listen, I, I've been a successful secret service agent, but can I be successful in the private sector? Can I do it? What, what is that like? Um, 
and are are my experiences um, and my 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 job skills are are those translatable to the private sector? Will 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 organizations see value in that? So I did probably what what a lot of of folks have done, and that is kind of quietly um, tested the waters out there with some some job interviews and some some employers and. You know, each one of those really was an experience unto its own. And that's, that's <laughs> and that's that's where I saw the what there are in federal law enforcement agencies and police departments. There are so many different cultures out there, which in, in the in the private sector with businesses. And and what that means um, is they all have very different um, understandings and levels of appreciation for the security function, mm. you know, in some organizations, and I'm sure you've probably talked about this, Eric, you know, some organizations place a very high premium on security and thus it will be positioned in the organization well, well upwards closer to, to the chairman or, or, or CEO. Now that I, in my experience, that's becoming less and less common. But, you know, in, in my experience, because that's what we're talking about now is my experience, I had the benefit of retiring in July of 2004. So less than three years after 9-11. So at that point in time, corporate America was scared shitless um, and they they wanted the best that they could find um, in terms of experience and they were willing to pay for it. I think, sadly, like so many things, as as time goes by, um, particularly when bad things haven't happened to organizations, they they tend to place less and less value. Um, kind of fast forwarding in my current role as a consultant, you know, we never get calls from from clients saying, "Hey, everything's great. Uh, <laughs> Touch base with you." You know, how's your day? No, um, it, it's they're they're calling clients are calling, and in the broader sense, organizations go looking for security people when they've had a bad experience, uh, or when they've or when they've had a close call. And this has been such an eye opener for me, Eric. Where a lot of very large companies out there that you would assume, because they're big names, they're big companies, they have big risk exposure, even if you don't know the internal workings well, you just know by the nature of their business and the amount of employees and what they do, you know, they've got big risk exposure. Yet a lot of them have very weak security functions. And I, and I always ask myself, where's, where's the board of directors, particularly in, in publicly owned companies, where's that board? Are they asleep at the wheel and not asking some basic questions of the leadership of the organization about, what they have in terms of security programs, workplace violence prevention programs, which is the absolute hot topic, you know, these days, workplace violence prevention. But, you know, kind of getting back to to my departure uh, from, from the Secret Service, and this is good. This is kind of a learning point for, for your listeners. Um, I had always um, thought how grand it would be to come back to my hometown or someplace in Texas, uh, because I was currently in Washington, D.C., come, come back to where I was raised in Texas and go to work for a privately owned oil company. I thought that would just be the greatest thing ever. So while I was discreetly probing around while, while still um, employed uh, in, with the Secret Service, you know, I sent my resume to a, a company in particular, which I would just assume leave leave the names out of it if if we could, but a, but a, but a highly respected privately owned oil company. I sent my resume um, and with with a note asking to be considered should they have any vacancies. And um, silence didn't even get a response, which I thought, well, okay, this is my introduction to to the transitional world, to the corporate sector. You know, it may, it may be a deafening silence. So that didn't go anywhere. Um, and so I continued to, to um, network, talk to people, um, you know, look uh, to the extent I could online as to what might be published, at which point I learned that some of the best jobs out there never make it 
you know, on online and are actually publicized or published. I think that's gotten better, but I know certainly at that time, so many of those good jobs were really hip pocketed, if you will, almost like realtors do with those, those hot listings. <laughs> right. You know? um, but, you know, several months went by and I'm sitting at my desk one day there in Washington, D.C., uh, in my nice government office, and my phone rings. And it's a, a former Secret Service colleague of mine who's calling from overseas. And coincidentally, so we, we catch up. Uh, I knew him well. We hadn't talked in a while. We, we caught up over the phone and come to find out he's working for that same privately owned company there in Dallas where I had sent my resume. And so he asked me, he goes, Jim, he goes, would you be interested in a in a role with with said company there in Dallas? And I said, well, Ralph, I said, absolutely, I would. I, I sent my resume in there six months ago and never heard a word. And and he said, oh, my gosh, he said, he goes, I thought of you. Um, they're about to make a decision. They've interviewed five other people. Uh, he goes, hang on and let me make a few calls. <laughs> and, and I said, well, well, yeah. So literally two hours later, he calls back and he get, he says, someone from, from the company is going to call you and schedule an interview. And I said, that's great, Ralph. I, I really appreciate it. From the time I received that call until the time I showed up in Dallas as a new employee for that company was literally less than 30 days. Wow. And it's funny the way the universe works. Um, what that taught me and, and maybe it's, it's something for listeners to consider is that sometimes the lack of response is, is not indicative of the fact they don't want or need you. It, it could in fact just be some type of technical or administrative glitch in, in this circumstance, I learned later that the folks that, that should have picked up on my resume when I sent it in. We're having some uh, pretty significant family issues and they were distracted from, from work um, to, to deal you know, with those family issues. And so um, resumes and kind of typical routine administrative uh, correspondence like I would have forwarded um, just kind of sat in the unattended pile. So that, that was the beginning of an absolutely fantastic career for me. Um, and I, I did learn, thankfully, that, that um, you know, the ability to, to, to work with other people and those skills that I picked up and that experience I picked up in the Secret Service, in fact, were transferable um, to, to that job um, in, in the private company. Now, I will be honest, Part of the reason that that people like myself get hired for those roles is because not only just our experience, it's who we know. What what network are we bringing to the benefit of that company? Um, in this case, the company I went to work for there in Dallas um, had significant operations in some some really sketchy, risky places um, internationally. So the ability to pick up the phone and and call a security counterpart, maybe with the U.S. Embassy or or even somebody that I knew from my government service who was now working in a similar private sector capacity with a um, with even a competitor company in that same region. That's that's gold right there to be able to pick up the phone and say, hey, what you know, what kind of challenges and experiences are you all having? Uh, that we can learn from, so we don't have to go through the school of hard knocks if we can if we can avoid it. So, I mean, that, to, to be real, you know, in the private sector, you get hired because of the, your perceived value to the company. So, and this was a hard lesson um, for me later, but you know, I had been raised with twenty plus years, Eric, working for a federal agency with civil service protection. And not that I ever felt like I was going to take advantage of that, but I, I felt somewhat protected. And I also felt like as long as I continue to do a good job here, I'm I'm golden for as long as I want to be here. 
Well, the reality, as you know, in the private sector, that is not the case. That is not the case. Um, and what one executive leadership team believes is a valuable individual um, can change if that leadership team leaves and they want to go the, the dreaded quote unquote, well, we want to go a different direction. That, that, <laughs> yes. but, but that's the reality, is it not? It is. It, it, is. it is. So um, I, I say this so that the folks transitioning can have a, a, a realistic expectation of the, the different um, set of ground rules, if you will, in the private sector. Uh, basically, one is there are no ground rules, or, or there's ground. The only ground rules that exist are, are those that the organization makes up or decides they want to abide by. Um, and listen, my experience was was fantastic. Um, how, however, I, I can also speak from the experience of things did change towards the end of my tenure there, where things were not so fantastic. Uh, why did that come about? Well. You know, that came about, um, and this is where I'm going to get vulnerable with you, um, that that came about for for a couple of different reasons. One is, yes, there was a change of, of leadership and a change of view about the security function. The other part that was, um, I feel like, what was on me was that I, <clears throat> being kind of the stubborn, resistant type that I am, um, I didn't necessarily buy into the new view, if you will. Um, and I felt like I knew very well what the people in that organization needed from a security perspective. And I was I was really um, committed and, and convicted to continue to deliver exactly what I felt like they needed. Because we're not talking about in some of these situations, we're not talking about theoretical threats or theoretical harm. I and mean, we're, we're talking about operating in some areas where there are bona fide um, threats um, and you know, terrorist organizations and gangs operating. So I felt strongly about my role to you know protect the people in the organization. And not that I was ever prevented or dissuaded from doing that, but I think the, the approach if I had to do it all over again, I, I think I would have been a little bit more intentional about um, developing relationships in that organization that could have uh, made my job and my career and my fulfillment a lot easier and better. So I think mean, that, that, that deserves a little bit of dissection here. When I first came into that role, I was blessed with a whole cadre uh, in, in the executive leadership team of supporters it did not have to win them over they are they were already on board 100 percent where i fell short was realizing as those people fell away from the organization retired moved on that um in retrospect i i i would have tried harder to to create um, through new relationships, uh, some kind of a, a replacement support team. Um, now, I, organizations are different in, in the roles that a security director or VP, in my, in my case, I was senior VP in charge of, of global security. Um, in, in my case, um, you know, I'm dealing with C-suite day in and day out. Um, and if everyone's on your team, that's, that's a lovely job. If, if you have people that you haven't worked with before that haven't had a bad experience security wise, um, they're going to naturally ask and, and question um, why we're doing certain things, why we're spending certain um, dollars. And, you know, particularly the oil industry, you know, has its cyclical ups and downs. So when oil is at $150 a barrel, uh, you can basically do no wrong. When it when it drops to half that, it's like, <clears throat> hey, what, what, you know, why are we spending money on on this particular program or this service or what have you? So, um, yeah, I I think if I have advice to um, to folks that are listening, is 
aside from what you can bring to the table um, to your, your new employer or your organization, um, aside from that, the, the other equally important thing is the quality of the relationships you can establish in those in those organizations. So, um, and I ha I've had some great conversations even recently, which um, tie into this this nicely. And you know, I think um, there's a lot of really smart and talented folks in these private sector organizations that are intimidated by, um, if not the security function, at least some of the incumbents or those that hold that role. And I've had, I've had some straight up conversations uh, with some, some brilliant people um, who have come to me that because I, I had a little bit of a relationship with them and, and expressed that to me like, hey, Jim, can you, you know, I've got this, this, this issue um, maybe it's a personal issue, um, security related. He goes, I, I, I don't know how, I mean, I had one guy tell me, he goes, I, I don't know how to talk to a police officer. And, and I, I'm, I'm afraid to approach somebody that has, has been a police officer. There's just this natural intimidation. So this, this leads back to how can you from, from, from somebody, I say you, how, how can, how can someone who's looking to make the transition, who's used to operating under the color of law and and the color of uh, badge and, and authority, um, how can you make that transition and come into the private sector role and kind of shed that part of your identity in, in the sense that now you're approachable, you're, you're trustworthy, you're um, pretty much on par with you know as an individual as a human uh, you're not expected to know everything you're you're the need for you to maintain a command presence is no longer necessary Ex except except in an incident or you know a crisis a real sure. crisis. but i'm bringing this up because i've listen you know i i certainly know a lot of um former officers agents that have come over um, to the private sector or tried, and it was an uncomfortable place for them because it's 256 shades of gray. It's it's not black and white. There is no rule book. There is no code of uh, criminal procedure book. There, there's no manual to go by to tell you exactly what to do. That can be uncomfortable. So, I mean, let's get right down to it. The private sector isn't for everybody. It's, it's, it's not. Um, and, don't feel um, slighted if you decide it's not for you. Absolutely, um, it's it's just it's an option. Um, there's there's a lot of folks I worked with that decided to stay in government, and they were great contributors in in different roles afterwards. And we need people like that. Um, if, at the same time, if you're going to be successful in in the private sector, you in many ways have to reinvent yourself um, for for most organizations, you really, really do. And, and that starts with presenting yourself not only as somebody that's valuable, but also value to an organization means that you are approachable. That means you can play well in the sandbox with everybody, Amen. not just other security people, but everybody right down <clears throat> to, um, you know, your facilities people, particularly, particularly your HR people who who have so much influence in the background that you may never know about um, until it's either to your benefit or it's too late <laughs> or you do anything about it. But, but, you know, those are critical roles. And, and I will tell you, Eric, I have seen, um, I think put it put another way, organizations, most organizations seem to place more value, not so much on your technical competence as on your ability to get along with others and use those soft skills. Am I right? Preach, preach, yeah. Jim, preach. Yeah. I have seen this over <clears throat> and over again um, in organizations I've either been a part of or worked with where the individual in charge of the security function or an important part of the security function is a great guy or gal, tremendous personality, you want, I mean, you want to work with that person, 
But as far as like their actual technical background, you look at it and you go, wow, that's honestly it's not impressive. But the truth is, for, for the security function to be carried out well in a lot of organizations, it is actually more important to be able to finesse your way through, uh, through relationships, through gentle persuasion, through, through the soft skills, all the stuff that honestly, back in the day in, in law enforcement, we shunned and prided ourselves on not having those skills. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, it's, <laughs> but it's a new world. It's so true. You know, I, I tell people all the time when I'm coaching them or even on these podcasts that your qualifications get you to the interview, yeah. but usually it's your ability to successfully assimilate into the culture oh. and get along with whoever you're going to be working with that ultimately gets you the job. So true. You know, and so I just, uh, I mean, it sounds so simple, but I mean, when I came out of law enforcement, you know, my wife used to say that I had this big, you know, F you written across my forehead, yeah. you know, and it was because I, I was, I was still very much in that cop mentality yeah. of yeah. everyone's the enemy. I need to have my head on a swivel, you know, that's situational right. awareness. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, that's a hard thing to break out of, but it is possible to break out of it and you need to break out of it in order to succeed. Yeah, that well put. I mean, that is, and that's a very, to break out of it, that is a very intentional set of exercise. It's a very intentional mind shift. So anytime you're, you're, you're trying to execute a mind shift, that is not an easy thing to do. But towards that end, kind of going back to what I was saying, there are, and usually if you can make good friends in HR and in a, in a new company, they can help you with that. They can help you with that, particularly on the HR side. Um, but it's necessary, you know, in this, in the security role, if you really do have some programmatic changes or improvements or things you want people to do differently, you've got to get their buy-in and, and that buy-in will not come under any type of exercise of official authority it will only come because they like you and they respect you and they trust you. So those are three key elements. Now, look, sometimes it's hard to be liked. I've been told before that I'm hard to like, uh, but it may, but uh, in, in, in all seriousness, to the extent you can get along with people and again, get that trust factor. And, and look, you know, having served in that corporate security role for, for almost 15 years, we had great relationships. Cause I say we, cause we really did. We, it, we did have a team. And I'd like to think I was an important part of that as well, where people felt comfortable coming to us and sharing a legitimate security concern. Um, and you want that. Uh, you want that in an organization. It makes you more effective. And, you know, that only comes from, from trust. And, you know, you don't build trust overnight. It takes a while. You can lose it pretty much overnight, but, you know, you just got to build it up um, over time. And, um, you know, you're, you're really, you're really working, working people, working with people. And, uh, so, you know, that's, um, you know, we, we kind of digressed for a, a short amount of time about kind of the, um, these soft skills and their importance, but I, I think it's, it was worth in our conversation here, that digression, because of just how important it really is. And you won't ever, you know, you won't, see that no one's going to come tell you that but you you just need to instinctively know that um yeah. and, and you know when we talk about that i i know as specifically when when i uh when when my team was hiring uh for a position and we hired a number of people and gosh we had some great candidates um and part of our process was we would do the initial screen and then if there was somebody that we really liked, we would we'd have them talk to um, others in the organization, in, in the C-suite. Um, and I know one individual as well that we really liked did not do himself any favors. Why? Because during some of those conversations, he reverted back, I guess, to cop talk, you know, and started talking about, started using like, you know, 
verbiage, language, acronyms, and things like that from his comfortable past, which just did not play well. Um, and so he he was eliminated from any further consideration. So would that have made him bad for the role? No, but you know, so you only have that one chance to make those first impressions. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and so, you know, part of the prep has to be, and I know you work with, with, with um, your folks, Eric, I know you work with others on, on getting their resumes translated um, into something that a business would like to see. And that demonstrates you're, you're, you're translating, you're interpreting all this experience into something that's business value. What's the business value. And, and so, um, that's, I, I know in our previous lives, our previous careers, it was damn important. The schools you went to, the experiences you had, the assignments you had, that, that spoke volumes about who you were. The problem is, as you know, in the, in the private sector, corporate sector, they, they don't recognize half that stuff. They don't know what it means. And <laughs> right. And, and back to a point I made earlier, it it scares some people in the organization like, oh, my gosh, we, we don't want to turn our security department into a police department. Right. We were always told, and I believe it's true, that like in corporate security, we don't want you guys to look like the bad guys. We don't. We understand you have to do some things that are unpleasant. We would prefer those things be in the background. But the forward facing part of the security department to our employees, we want that to be, hey, we're here to help you. We're here to protect you. We're here to to uh, to help you focus on your business. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Yeah. I uh, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, a lot of this, you know, to your point about the interview, like I, I bring this up quite a bit and I, I have permission from the individual that it happened to. Mm -hmm. But um, I was working with a, an SES individual the other day, and he mm -hmm. was basically just saying, you know, I can't seem to make it to the final interview stage. Yeah. I keep on making it to the middle, but I can't progress any mm -hmm. further. I think it might mm -hmm. be an issue with how yeah. I'm presenting myself. And I was like, okay, well, let's do a mock interview, okay. you know? And so I put him through one and I asked him, one of the questions I asked him was a very, very common behavioral question that we've all been asked, which is, uh -huh. You know, tell me about a time that you experienced conflict in the workplace. Right. You know, how did, what was the problem? How did you sure. handle it, et cetera? Yeah. And I just said, okay, shoot, tell me what you would say. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for those of, of you who are listening, what the corporate sector wants in, from you in this scenario is a two to three minute blurb on a very simplistic example of a mm -hmm. conflict that you had, how you addressed it and how you moved on. Like no <laughs> jargon, no terminology. That's going to be hard yeah. to understand. Just yeah. I had a disagreement. Yeah. This is what it was causing. This is what I did to fix it. Done. Yeah. Right. And he launched into this 20 minute diatribe oh, on a contentious relationship that he had with, he had with a former CI. Ooh. And yeah. I, yeah. after we got done with the whole thing, I said, okay, well, I have a fairly good idea of why you're not progressing further, you know, but I said, look, no one understands what the CI is, right? No one especially understands the special relationship that a handler has with his or her CI. Mm -hmm. And that is going to go completely over people's heads yeah. in the private sector. Yeah. And I was like, it doesn't matter how experienced you are and what a good fit you are on paper. Right. For the role is if you bring that scenario up in a room full of corporate types, mm -hmm. they're going to be like, oh, no, you know, yeah. right. so like I said, it, it's, you know, obviously he reverted back to something that was extremely comfortable to him. Mm -hmm. And were he still in a law enforcement capacity would have been totally fine. Sure. You know, exactly. but I, I tell people all the time that you have to understand who your audience is. Right. You know, and if your audience isn't the same people that you're used to dealing with for the past 20 years, then, you know, you need, you need to really consider how you're going to approach that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's right. It gets back to that, you know, being very in intentional about, you know, how you want to present yourself, knowing how that will translate into a perception. Um, and and look, you know, while we're talking about this. Applying for a job, making that transition, that's very much like dating, okay? The chemistry's got to be right. 
And, yep. I'm, and I'm sure you coach your prospective um, job applicants, Eric, that, you know, you want that chemistry to be right so that you should be sizing the firm and the organization up just as much as they're sizing you up. And I, yes. know, com- I know coming out, um, you know, from a law enforcement career in the private sector, that's exciting. You, you, you know, it feels like one more challenge, you know, we're, we're all driven to succeed and we want to do that. And, and so I think we have got to resist um, the urge to accept the first thing that comes our way as well, which may be difficult to do because, you know, here's this prospect of, Hey, you know, I'm going to be so much better off financially. This is kind of like my, my big chance, but I would just urge your listeners to like, you know, really think long and hard about what you're raising your hand for with that particular company. There's so many different companies out there and, you know, I don't know how you coach, um, um, Eric, but you know, there's going to be very few opportunities out there that meet like all five of your must-haves. But <laughs> yeah, uh, and <laughs> so there, there, those are few and far between. Um, I so I think if there's a if there's a a job a role out there where it you know meets at least three of yours, um, and it's an improvement to your quality of life, which I'm which I'm a big believer of. Listen. I, and I tell people that, that come to me directly, if, you know, if you have a high quality of life right now and what you're considering is not at or above that quality of life, stay put until you find something. Don't don't make that jump. Don't make that leap just to say you did it. You know what I'm saying? Because um, at the end of the day, it this is a quality of, of life issue. You know, people are wanting to transition to to you know, provide better for their families, for their long-term future, but, but don't do it at the expense of your overall happiness because that just, that won't last, you know, and no amount of money um, is, is going to be worth it. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And, yeah, you know, I yeah. tell people quite frequently that if you have the option, you know, please stay where you are while you mm-hmm. look for another job. Absolutely. You know, you you are so much more employable with yes. a current job than you are with without, and and listen for for those listeners that that maybe they're further along in the process whatever I, I will share some of my other lessons learned here that I've passed on to my colleagues in the private sector um, you know kind of un, again unlike a government or um, a municipal. Um, role where, again, you're in the driver's seat as to how long you want to stay there. Unlike that, if you're in the private sector and you start to feel the headwinds blowing, pay attention, Uh, pay attention. And that's the time if you feel like that's the beginning of a trend um, where your life is going to be difficult, at that time, be proactive and start looking then while you're still employed. It's kind of a corollary to what you're just what we just talked about. You're much more employable um, having a current role than, than you are with without a current role. Because look, you know, again, unlike a civil service protected um, agent, these roles in the private sector, to be honest, they all have shelf lives. They all have shelf lives, which which means it's unrealistic to 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 think that. Uh, now I'm not saying it's 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 impossible, but it's increasingly rare to make that jump into private sector role and and be there for another you know ten or twenty years. I, it, it it happens. It is it, it's increasingly rare. Why is that? That which is unfortunate. It is un, it is unfortunate, but it's a re, it's a reality. Yeah, um, it is a reality. So I think you know part of the skill set of um, while we're talking here about prospective job applicants is, is knowing that, listen, you know, if you get that job that you think you want, it looks good. You're going to do your best there, but you're the only way to have true job security is to always have a plan B is to always have a plan B. Amen. Um, Because again, when organizations, if they're facing economic hardships or they're having a major change in leadership or who knows whatever market conditions they they may have to just look across the board and figure out where they're going to cut. 
And it's yeah. nothing personal. And, and they'll tell you that. Listen, it's nothing personal. You've done a great job for us, Jim. But you know what? We, um, you know, we, we're going to go a different direction or we've, we've got to cut some costs here. So I'm sorry this, you know, thank you very much for your service. Have a, have a nice day. And and of course, you know, that's in, in stark contrast to a, a job in, in law enforcement or in, with a federal agency where, you know, that would never happen in one day. Um, there would be just a, this long lead up, as as you know, there would <laughs> right. be no, no surprises and, and, there, and there would be something behind it. There'd be some major transgression or a rule infraction or, or something very, very serious. You know, the day of, of, of rifts um, is, is exceedingly rare in, in the federal government. But my, my point is the private sector plays by a different set of rules. Um, it plays by a different set of rules. So I think, um, you know, maintaining that agility, that um, ability that um, and, and, and changing with the with with the tides in an organization is is super important. But knowing at the end of the day, there could be something unexpected, totally out of your control that, that may put you on the street. And um, what's going to be your next move? Who are you going to go to? What are you going to do? Um, so as much as we talked about how important it is to maintain relationships in your organization. It's damn important to maintain them outside your, your organization. Amen. It is. And it's, it's an, it's an always evolving process. Yeah. You yeah. know, like I tell people never stop connecting, never stop building relationships, never stop maintaining yeah. relationships, you know, um, no matter, I mean, I, we are, we're all busy, Yeah. you know, and, but sending someone a message takes five seconds. I know it is. It's work, though, Eric, to your point. It really is. It's it's work, but it's an investment that you you really just need to make for for yourself. And and truthfully, it helps you in your business as, as well as, you know. But um, to your point, sending these messages, staying in touch with people can be super, super helpful if, if the unexpected you know comes your way, which sometimes happens. Absolutely, brother. So. You know, as, as we start to, to wrap up a little bit, um, mm. what is what is some pieces of advice that we haven't previously talked about that you would recommend that individuals consider when they're thinking about transitioning? Yeah, I think, you know, I know everyone's going to have a little bit of a, a, a different spin on this, but I I would encourage um, individuals to really kind of do some self work. Um, in the sense that give, you know, do the type of work that you need to do to, to be aware of who you are, where you've been, but also know the type of, of person that you need to be for where you want to go. Okay. This is a journey. Um, I've certainly learned a lot. I, I wish, you know, looking back, I think I could have, you know, had an even better run uh, in the private sector than I've already had if if maybe I, I would have been a little bit more in, intentional about um, where am I strong? Where am I weak? Um, right. how, can, how can I kind of leverage my strengths? But how do I really and truly go about um improving and addressing my, my weak points and, and be strong enough to, to just own it um, and be cognizant of it. And, and, and that's, that's step one, you know, and, and step two is, is, yeah, where, where am I, where am I weak? How can I improve? And these are, and these, and I'm speaking here from really a personal level of, you know, where am I as strong as I need to be with connecting with people, you know, have my have my connections in the past really been superficial and they've been just kind of at, at a certain, you know, business level because I, I want to learn to do that better. How can how can I be more approachable um, going into this new role? What do I have to do differently? You know, I'm in a different role. I'm I'm occupying a different position. I'm dealing with a a whole different client base, if you will. So what do I need to do differently? Um, and be willing to expect that as we uncover and look into ourselves, there's going to be some of those areas that, you know, we may not we, we may not be too happy about. But that's that's where you first um, can start to, uh, you know, make some of those improvements. And don't don't be afraid to do it. Don't be afraid to get some, you know, 
outside, you know, help or, or um, third, you know, third party kind of opinions, counselors, whatever the case may be. I mean, there's, this is a world of, of information overload. There's so much out there, you know, um, audio books, et cetera. But, um, you know, coming into a new organization, they, they want to see someone who is receptive to their culture, someone who's receptive to the way they do things. So all this great experience and training that you've got, you've got to kind of keep that in the background and not let that get ahead of you. Yeah. Because what, what organizations don't want to see is somebody coming to them that, hey, they may be a um, technical stud in, in that sense of the word, but so much so that that they're going to let they're going to lead with their past experience and and not with, oh, how can I help this organization? This is a different organization. How, how do I need to be a team player in this role? Right. And, and so that's that's probably I would just you know, my advice, just go as deep as 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 you can on, on that personal level. And people will see that. Um, and they appreciate a certain amount. You know, you're not expected to be perfect walking into these interviews interview interview interviewers they like to see someone i believe that is willing to say hey you know i'm, I'm kind of good in these areas but um you know I'm, I'm 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 an open book here um willing to help and and absorb whatever i can that's my number one role here is to facilitate business um you know i'm not joining a security organization like i came from i realize that i'm joining a business organization organization i'll just try to use some of my security experience to further your business objectives absolutely absolutely brother oh you've given us a lot of great advice and you know this has been a really really fun conversation with you jim yeah. it always always is and yeah. you know um i know that this is going to resonate with a lot of people who are coming out of not only federal law enforcement but just law enforcement in general sure and you know the lessons that you've shared are applicable to a wide swath of individuals across all forms of public sector, but also the private as well. And that's what's so really fun about doing these podcasts is yes, yeah. we're, we're focusing on a very niche subset of the population, yeah. but the lessons and the experiences and the examples that we're sharing are, they're really applicable to almost everybody. Yeah, And, yeah. you know, it's, it's really it's really cool to see the feedback that we get where like someone mm -hmm. is like, Hey man, I just felt like he was talking directly to me, Yeah, <laughs> you know, or, you know, whatever the case may be. And honestly, that if, if we can help one person oh, sure. through these podcasts, sure. really understand that, Hey, I do have something valuable to offer. There is some self work I need to do to, to put my best self forward. Right. But yeah, you know, it's very possible to transition successfully, no matter the circumstances of your departure. Oh, I, I could not agree more. And listen, this universe works in some pretty strange ways. Um, it does. So I would just encourage your listeners, like trust the process. Don't, don't lose hope. Don't get discouraged. Do not here. Here's my, I want to, I want to close with do not take rejection as a statement of your self-worth. Do mm. not has nothing to do with it. Some organizations are just not prepared. Some of them, you have no idea what's going on in the, in, in the back room where maybe they have ex initially expressed some interest in you and then they go quiet or dark. Um, it could be for a zillion different reasons, but but don't interpret that as, a, as some type of message about your self-worth. It's easy to do, but don't get in your head about it. Do not get in your head about it. Well said. Well said. That's that's something that I, I recently spoke with someone about as well. And, you know, um, you know, having been a hiring manager now, having done a fair bit of sourcing on the side and mm -hmm. um, yeah. a few other things as well. Like, you know, once you're on the other side of the of the curtain, so to speak, <laughs> yeah. you realize yeah. Oh, yeah. just how much goes on behind the scenes. Well, and, yeah. you know, people who interview, they're expecting a quick response, quick exactly. feedback. When in reality, it takes a lot of work to even get to that thought, that that perspective. Oh, oh yeah, one quarterly financial review may may delay the hiring. You know, um, you know what I'm saying. Quarterly statement comes out, 
you know, the bean counters aren't happy, like, mm, you know what, let's just put a pause on hiring for right now. You may never know that, but those yeah. are the types of things that, that, you know, that can pop up or again, just some administrative or technical glitches like I experienced initially. So. Um, yeah. It's just important to recognize that there are so many things going on behind the scenes, right? 99.99% have nothing to do with you. <laughs> exactly. You know? yeah. And you just keep moving forward. Exactly. You know, if they get back to you, great. If not, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's a number. Wow. It's a numbers game with, with with your applicant. I mean, that kind of goes back to that dating analogy. Just keep, you know, just keep plugging ahead. Eventually, you'll land on something. Somebody will find you. You'll find them. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I've never, I've never quite thought about it that way from a dating analogy, but it's 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 extremely true. And right. uh, it's kind of like when you're you do you know, you're doing those blind dates. You know, you're just going from one person to one person. Like, hey, are we a good fit? Hey, are we a good fit? Yeah, you definitely. Know? And but, but Eric, think about it. I, I That came to me because we're talking about how important the chemistry is between the applicant and the organization. And it's the same way kind of in the dating world. You're not going to get that. You know, you might get a second, but you're not going to get that third date if the chemistry isn't there. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm going to, I'm going to have to start using that when I coach people now. Um, that's yeah. awesome. Well, Hey Jim, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for yeah, you know, just being helpful. willing to share with people and, oh, yeah. and being vulnerable. And um, oh, yeah. it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here. No, likewise. I just love the fact, you know, you're helping the people that are so near and dear to my heart and that are such an important part of you know, our respective pasts. So you're doing great work, Eric, and always happy to help. Let me know. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jim. Appreciate you. Take care. All right. See you now. Bye. Bye.